Well, good morning, and welcome to the Water Challenge, Doing More With Less. My name's Rodney Smith, president of Stratacon, Inc. You can go look at my bio, but I'm a road warrior in water wars. Uh, we also have today uh, Sanjay Gar from Raftelis Financial Consultants, Susan Leal from the Urban Water Works, Andy Lipkus, a tree person or people? Tree people. I'm one. Yeah. Tree people. Tree people. The group. Uh, we also have Francis P.V. Weber from the State Water Resources Control Board. If you have water rights, you got to know her. <laughs> Moss Montesoto, well, who is next. a yeah. family farmer who thought he had water rights yeah. and wants to um, That's talk to Francis. Yeah, yeah, right. And of course, we have the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, uh, food and Agriculture, Karen <coughs> Ross Michael. No, Karen Ross. I don't know where the Michael thing is. Oh, okay. I didn't no, know where no, it came no, from. Just, I'm not trying to be an alias. Here. Oh, okay. I just <laughs> wondered if you wanted to go a little <laughs> below, <laughs> on here. Anyway, if I, if I may have slide one, please. Okay, this gives you the impression, or uh, shows you how the hydrologic conditions in California have progressed over the last few years from happy days and happy land to increasingly uh, red zone. And of course, that's why people talk about the problems of our drought. Slide two, please. And as you can see, precipitation in the state has been falling below long-term uh, averages. But note that precipitation, even just a year or so, is right around the average. So what's going on? Hmm. Slide five, please. What this is, is there's something called tree ring studies, where scientists can go and study uh, tree rings to reconstruct the hydrologic uh, history far beyond when we were around. And this is a, a report from Department of Water Resources that was out last year, where they track the, uh, in the Sacramento Valley, uh, the hydrologic conditions since 900, so that's over 11 centuries of data. One thing that's interesting, about, uh, when I saw this, I was interested in two points. One is, notice long-term running average of 100 years is pretty flatlined. But notice the volatility in, our, in Mother Nature. When we were using much less water, we could live within volatility much easier than when we start moving up and using more water. So if you do options theory or valuations, you know, you move up with volatility, there becomes a time when all of a sudden you switch from a relatively low risk world to a very high risk world. And that's where we are today. We've also found, uh, if you're not in the industry, one last fact before I turn turn this over to our uh, panel, is that the state and federal water projects, the backbone of the Central Valley and up in Northern California last year were remarkable in that uh, for, uh, they had zero allocations except for some uh, uh, water users. This had been the backbone of, of Central Valley economy as well as uh, real estate development. So there's a real change here. Geez, this is, uh, we've, we've relied on something and it's broken. So we're doing more with less. So Secretary Ross, uh, in light of the drought and the fact that, we, you know, with the lack of project deliveries uh, in the last, couple, uh, last year, and who knows what's going to do this year, certainly put a spotlight on, 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 uh, on the people that you are over, the farming community. And everyone, of course, looks at them as using 80% of the developed water supply. What will doing more with less actually look like for California and our food supply? Well, I think it will mean um, a continual change in our cropping patterns, which we've already seen, as well as um, continued commitment to improved efficiency. One of the things I like to point out is that what we grow in this state doesn't happen in a lot of other places because of our Mediterranean climate. We are the ones that grow over 90% of the broccoli, over 90% of the strawberries, over 90% of the grapes, almost 100% of all the nutrient-dense tree, nuts, um, citrus, go through the list, 75% of the leafy greens. So from a nutritional aspect, 
um, those are the crops that have the highest value and water will move where the most economic return will happen and hopefully we'll be able to continue to also be a part of meeting the nutrient needs of people here and around the world. One of the statistics I like to use is a 40-year period between 1967 and 2007 where applied water use in agriculture declined 14.5%, but the productivity for every acre foot of water used increased over 85%. Mm -hmm. I think with technology, we will continue to see those kinds of efficiency gains, in fact, improve. Sensor technology, um, the use of weather stations, which is already pretty prevalent, the ability to bring many, many data points on evapotranspiration, humidity in the soil, temperature, what's happening in, in plants by plant as opposed to block by block. All of those kinds of things will feed into hopefully user-friendly, real-time data so mm -hmm. people can continue to optimize that resource okay. for well, economic productivity and improved quality and improved environmental outcomes. In terms of the write-up for this session, you know, we had water pricing, commoditization. What you can already see is there's a great investment opportunity in technology and change, as well as moving water around, which gets, if you want to move water around this state, you got to meet Francis from the state board. <laughs> In fact, what's interesting, one of the tenets of Western water rights is first in time, first in right. Mm -hmm. So seniority matters. It's sort of like, you know, a senior debt holder versus a junior versus subordinated. And of course, that's a bedrock, not only of uh, water law and law school, but for investors. And so, I am I right, Francis, this is probably the first time the state boards had to actually get inundated with administering a priority system, and what did you learn from that experience? And do you think you really have enough infrastructure at the state board to think we can support trading? What are we learning, not what did we learn? We are learning every day. And what we uh, started with in uh, just in November, or in, uh, in, um, in February, we started with, uh, the water rights system controlling surface water rights, and we, uh, we were administering it. By the end of the year, in September, groundwater had entered the picture. There was new legislation for groundwater. And so we are moving into a, a world where water, both at the surface level as well as at the groundwater level, will be managed uh, it, together in the future. And that's going to be a huge learning experience for everyone, absolutely everyone. We don't have a, a priority system set up for uh, groundwater, but there will be a need, uh, and in fact, many of the local folks are looking at how they will, will manage groundwater. So what are we learning? We're learning that uh, we need a lot more tools. We don't have meters uh, in many, many areas where water is used. And without meters, you simply don't know what's going on. We have done curtailments. And actually, you can bring up a, uh, uh, slide number 11. The state acted very, very quickly as soon as it was clear that there was a drought, and we uh, did a lot of things among the various or, uh, organizations in the state, the Department of Water Resources, uh, Department of Food and Ag, the State Water Board, and, uh, but among the things that the State Water Board did is that we began to curtail so-called junior water rights, water rights that were acquired after 1914. And uh, in that curtailment, we uh, basically, people couldn't take that water. Now, many people have many different water rights for their systems, and so they, uh, and, and some of them have groundwater. And so those who got their water rights for surface water curtailed often move to groundwater. In the future, in the longer term future, uh, this is going to be more, um, more managed locally, uh, in my opinion. But we found that um, we 
had we, we've been having to use um, uh, uh, the supply curves, the, the, the curves that uh, based on how much rain is coming in, and we look at them every morning, and and that's how we make our determinations as to when to lift curtailment or when to uh, bring curtailment on. And it's very crude. It's really quite crude. We've done some of this in the past, um, but. Uh, but not at, at this statewide level. Right now, however, curtailments have been lifted, I think, as of yesterday. And uh, there are uh, just two areas, the Scott and um, one other area I've forgotten right now, uh, that, that still have curtailments on them. But we are uh, at, the, at the most rudimentary uh, er, uh, level. And I had mentioned uh, that for those who want to get into markets, we're going to have to know a whole lot more before markets are going to function. We're going to have to, and then how we're going to know that, we're going to have to have investment in, uh, in meters. We're going to have to have investment in knowledge about what is actually going on with our water, both at the surface level as well as at the ground, groundwater level. So for those of you interested mm -hmm. in markets, I look forward to the kinds of investments you want to make. I think that sort of fits well with the earlier theme of the session about how California needs to invest in certain types of infrastructure, and it's more than dams in the water business. It's really, we don't measure our commodity very well. Uh, Moss is a guy who sort of is out there, literally, he's at ground zero, actively <laughs> engaged in farming, and, and relying on these projects that were uh, just empty last year. Have you changed your view of the world about these water supplies at all? Well, when you talk about reliability, the longer I farm and the older I get, the, the term reliability becomes more elusive. Uh, <laughs> I think you have to look at the dichotomy in farming. One, farmers have always understood we're at the mercy of nature. But at the same time, farming is all about the manipulation of nature, and so that's, that's sort of the dichotomy. We get our water from two sources, as Francis talked about, surface water, and people forget surface water is not individually owned. It's usually by groups, water districts, uh, uh, different types of agencies, so it's as if there's a hundred tribes of water in the state. And that's not for me to figure out, it's 2, for Karen. 2,000 or 3,000 <laughs> tribes. So you have to herd and, and get all those tribes. The second level of water is groundwater. And up to now, groundwater was always thought of being privately and individually run. It's changing now, and that's the second type of debate and conversation that's unfolding. Um, what I'd like to bring up is this whole notion of up until recently, water was anonymous. Mm -hmm. We never had an identity of water from urban areas or even uh, farmers. And we thought of surface water and groundwater as the same thing. And we're discovering as water becomes less and less anonymous, these changes, fundamental changes are occurring, such as groundwater this year and a new concern about how are they going to measure it. And what happens when water does not become anonymous? You begin to start asking questions of who's using it, how much they're going to use, and what it's used for. And then you can start attaching, as the economists would point out, the value of water. Right, Sanji? Yes. <laughs> Well, we've started in, out in the country here from an agricultural point of view. It's time to sort of change to the city folks, you know, in terms of what does all this mean for the city folks? The reason why that's important, by the way, Stratacon has a tendency to represent senior water right holders. So city folks have a tendency to have the most junior claims. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, you may have the votes and all that, but you got the junior claims. So you're at the most risk. So from a city point of view, you know, how do you manage this? I mean, uh, Susan, um, potable reuse is becoming increasingly a viable part of many cities' water supply portfolios outside the state of California. Wichita, uh, Wichita Falls, Texas recently went into a reuse program rather than go bone dry. From your point of view, because I know you're very active in, the, in this state, what, what's the most significant reason why we haven't seen potable reuse um, in, in, uh, in California? Well, well actually, um, we have seen a lot of it. Um, but we've kind of gotten stuck. And we need some 
some leadership, because we're talking about groundwater, we're talking about surface water, and you've mentioned now what I would think of as new water. Right. Or in Singapore, they refer to the recycled water as new water. Hmm. And we've kind of gotten stuck. We got to, in 2008, we have a situation where Orange County um, had fully developed a groundwater replenishment program uh, based on recycled water, sewer water. And they make no bones about it. They say gray water, sewer water, turned into enough water, by, again, by 2008 for 600,000 people. And we've kind of gotten stuck after that. There's been other recycling projects, mainly in the, some of uh, uh, Los Angeles County and, and in San Diego, they're looking at another project too. Um, and and we have to really, as urban customers, both in the north and in the south, but in the south with uh, the surface water, majority of the surface water being in the north and the majority of the population being the south, uh, some of the uh, southern counties have come up, as Orange County did with that reuse. But I mentioned we're, being, we're stuck in that a lot of the counties, uh, including the, uh, San Francisco and uh, San Diego is aggressively looking at what we would call direct potable reuse. And that means there's no environmental barrier like there is in Orange County. Orange County, I think you're all familiar with, you basically take that sewer water, take it through an advanced treatment process where it's cleaner than most raw water that you'll ever encounter and then put it through a treatment plant and then, or I'm sorry, put it into groundwater. Then when it gets pulled out of the ground, it goes through the treatment plant like everything else. So right now, uh, San Diego is actually investing in, they've pulled together a whole team to try to uh, uh, start looking at that direct potable reuse, which means augmenting your surface water or directly your, your drinking water supply with that highly treated wastewater. Again, that's wastewater that is cleaner than most raw water. In fact, is cleaner than it and most raw water. So, but we have this problem where the state is saying that by, in the most recent legislation, that there'll be some criteria by the Department of Public Health and by the Water Board that will set up, give permission, if you will, for these different water utilities, gov mostly government-run water utilities, to come up with this new water. So that's where we need some, mm -hmm. some not to be reactive. Mm -hmm. The state doesn't need to be reactive, but needs to be proactive and not wait till 2016, but push the Department of Public Health to come up with those mm -hmm. regulations, come up with those criteria. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so um, leadership, I think, is what we're talking about to get some new water. Well, whenever California. you're talking about institutional change, obviously we need leaders to lead, otherwise there's no change. And there I you guess, go. And I there. guess what I'm hearing here is leadership has yet to emerge on this issue. Um, Andy, again, as a representative of a lot of ag uh, people throughout the West, there's a constant political narrative about how ag or change Sure, should be changing its water use practices, but isn't there a comparable opportunities in, in municipal use in the landscape area? That's where the good news is, actually. There's a huge opportunity to um, put a cork in the bucket that is pouring out our water. Uh, Los Angeles hemorrhages nearly half the water we need in rainfall. Uh, and um, this isn't conjecture. I just returned last week uh, from taking a delegation of 16 California water leaders from Felicia Marcus, the head of the state water board, to Nancy Sutley, uh, new chief sustainability and economic development officer for DWP. City, county, uh, people across, across the state went to look at the model for us. Um, Australia, who two years ago finished a 12-year drought a drought that was so severe it nearly took out the country and their response to it from governmental to people is an incredible model. Um, and by the way, I should honor the fact that the Consul General of Australia is sitting right here in the front row uh, and they're, they're amazing partners and also in the room, Bo 
representatives of Boeing who has, it may sound really odd, but they have underwritten Tree People's research into Australia's water solutions for the last four years. And um, it is significant. They, through a combination of incentives and disincentives, uh, move the population to go to radical conservation. So in a city like uh, Brisbane, they drop their water use from 80 gallons per person per day to 33. Wow. And in a very few years, and they did it, as I said, with providing incentives, plus the threat of penalties and public flogging. Um, <laughs> but um, not really. I'd like to show a couple. Uh, if you can go to slide seven, you're going to see one of, one of the solutions that was deployed across the country. So they took a countryside tradition of tanks. That bottom picture is, uh, these are all shot in the last couple of weeks. Um, this is a family with standing in front of their 30,000 gallons of storage from their rooftop. Um, the upper left is a condo size rain tank. This is a cistern that's 5,000 liters, about 1,100 gallons, fits in a very small space. We're not talking about rain barrels, 50 gallon thimbles here. We're talking about real, real um, significant rainwater harvesting. The federal government, the state governments provided significant incentives that moved the population to install millions and millions of these, and it more than doubled their supplies. But it changed the game in terms of water literacy and valuing water. So when people had their own rain bank account in front of them, they completely changed their behavior and spent those rain dollars very, very differently. Right. Um, I'll go on, I think, it, uh, right. further in the next question. Okay. I have a quick question for Andy. Yeah. How did the farming community reach that tipping point? Was it through flogging or what was it? How did they <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, the farming community, I think, had to adapt um, like we are. But they, you know, Australia followed Israel very early in, in very uh, efficient technologies. Mm -hmm. But uh, amazingly, since we're talking about recycled water, uh, we were taken to farms, believe it or not, organic, biodynamic, the highest hmm. ranking of health and protection of, uh, of public health, these farmers paid to, to install a water line from the wastewater treatment plant. Mm. Oh, sure. Um, so their farms could grow stuff. And the quality of the, the crops is good, if not better. Be careful. Well, let me, let me, let me tell you what they've, what they've done in the winery where I was. Yeah, I used to be in the wine world. Well, so they're, they're using recycled water portions of the year, and they're making sure they're flushing the soil with fresh water when it's available. California grape growers do that, too. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, um, but they do. answering the question, that they, how they've been adapting and succeeding. And I would just add that uh, farm, and, and you can ex expand on this, agriculture is getting into recycled water big time. Right. Uh, the Water Board mm -hmm. has made available $800 million that we did this in March, I believe, $800 million at 1% interest as a loan uh, that could be, a, it's a 30-year term, and people, we are going to be running out of that money this year. That's in less than a year. $800 million out the door. Yeah. Can I add one more tribute sure. to Australia because they've been so mm -hmm. generous in sharing is the investment they've made in their delivery system, the catchment and delivery mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. which is a challenge for us when we talk about aging infrastructure mm -hmm. and we look at um, loss of water, just moving it mm -hmm. and not having real-time delivery so that the delivery system matches the technology for on-farm efficiency are very mismatched right now. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. it, it, what we say, um, well, a uh, crisis is the mother of invention. <laughs> That's right. And of course, as a PhD economist, I also think about how crisis may be, be a form of communication, sort of challenging, channeling Hayek, Hayek right now. Sanjay, right now, because for example, notice this session talked about rethinking of water pricing. For now, let's just start with the existing situation. As a general man matter, how is water pricing set today for water users, be they on the farm or mm -hmm. in the city? So water is, um, first, you know, there's a, sometimes a misconception that water is um, paid by, it should be considered as a property tax, you know, your rates or it's a tax. And it's not. You actually pay for a service. And the concept is, is that a water is an enterprise, self-sufficient, similar to a business, 
Um, it should generate enough revenues from its rates to cover the cost of providing that service. Now, there are, in, in the public sector, there are um, legal constraints or regulatory um, frameworks called cost of service. And the concept is, is that those individuals that bear a certain cost should pay for those costs. So individuals who, in the water world, we call peaking or using certain certain um, sources of supply should pay more than other individuals who may not have the same kind of consumption patterns. Now, the challenge, though, in the water industry is, is that we're a fixed cost business. Um, actually, water is the most capital intensive product there is. The other one's wastewater. Um, most water utilities, 90% of the cost is fixed. So think about it, you have a business, it's 90% fixed. If you sell one molecule or you sell a million molecules, 90% of your cost is still there. Now, we're in a drought, and we're in this situation where we're doing rationing. And that is the, the challenge that we're facing in the community. The other challenge that we're facing is, Rod, as you mentioned, is the different sources of supplies and the different um, rights that individuals have. And some individuals have very cheap water. And, and that creates a lot of mismatch in the incentives that we have. So we have water in some areas of California where people buy it for, what, $50 an acre feet? And then you have some areas where people are buying or producing water over $2,000 an acre feet. And these communities are actually interconnected through the system. So you could theoretically have a trade, but because of institutional barriers, we don't. Well, this is a follow-up question. Wouldn't it be factually correct to say that if anyone looks at their water rate, it's mostly driven by the infrastructure of delivery? It, historically, yes. Historically, that, yeah, yeah. Historically. And it, today. And I would say now that's changing. And we're in this transitional period. Um, historically, water was to pay for the infrastructure costs. And most of that cost, actually, I forgot to mention, is, co is collected on the commodity, on the sales, not on the fixed charge. So you have one side of the business, you're 90% fixed, as I mentioned. And then historically, as a community, we wanted to express water as a value. We wanted to have affordability. So we put most of the costs on the commodity section. So there's a disconnect now from that system. And, mm -hmm. and, and I would say we're in a transitional, I mean, as, as stated before, water is not, um, people know about water. It used to be, you know, in the background, no one really paid attention to it, but water is now the forefront. And because of the challenges that we're facing, it's going to get more and more. And also the other one is the bill. The water bill has uh, historically, in the last 12 years, it was most likely around $30 average in the county, I mean, in the state, excuse me. Now it's around 60 or $70. So that's a basically a seven or eight percent compounding interest mm -hmm. in the increase in the water bill. Still, you know, seventy dollars for most of us is like, well, whatever. But for some communities, that's a lot of money. And 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 I, the tipping stone, I think, is, is going to eventually in the next four or five years will be over a hundred dollars mm -hmm. for the average customer. So, well, do, do you think in twenty years I'll be able to sell my water to LA? Mm. I, you know, it's funny. We we talked a little bit about, you know, and. Whether it's, I think trading is going to happen. Mm. It's just when is the, what kind of crisis do we need for it to happen, right? So is it going to happen in the next five years? Is it going to happen in the next 40 years? But I, I uh, thought Moss, we're not going to need uh, to buy it. No, 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 there's trading now. Our firm uh, is broker transactions. Now, yes. So give me a call, Moss, if you want some water. Yeah, if you're really interested, but well, your daughter would be upset yeah. if yeah. you gave her the farm without Well, I'm water. not going to last that much long, <laughs> so. Oh, OK. <laughs> Andy. Well, what we're hearing here is, I think, we've, there's a transformation here. We've got to manage our volatility, our dependence. Uh, we, had, we had a good rock and roll uh, uh, past, and we've got to be adults going forward. So mm -hmm. we're going to have to invest. Andy, what, f given what you do, and for example, uh, uh, municipalities are starting to offer people $2 a square foot to take out their lawn permanently. And if you do the math, that's about $60,000 an acre foot is what, this, what the municipality is valuing, taking that water out. Andy, if I gave you $150 million, how would you spend it in, in urban use? I would actually do what DWP is preparing to do. Uh, it's a little known fact that the Department of Water and Power is now in year two of a stormwater capture master plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they have uh, had significant engineering firms, Geosyntec and others, mo first of all, calculate how much we're throwing away. And the numbers came back stunning. It is close to half. Um, and by the way, even in the driest year in 
uh, calendar history last year, we still threw away 28 billion gallons in runoff from Los Angeles, mm -hmm. which was capturable. And if it was captured, that represented 6,500 gallons per person for each of the 4 million of us, right? So it's, that's on the driest year in record. So it rains here, and we don't see it, and we throw away huge volumes. So DWP's- So, so you're talking about stormwater. Stormwater. Then. And so um, they're investing, they're preparing to invest in groundwater recharge and, and treating the aquifers. We need to do all of that. It's all on the table. But uh, Jim uh, McDaniel, the head of water, last uh, just in April after looking at the feasibility of bringing together the stormwater agencies the wastewater agency with DWP to cooperate that makes this stuff economically feasible instead of single purpose he declared that the fastest he believed that now the fastest way to bring significant new supplies online in LA is through uh, integrated distributed rainwater harvesting uh -huh. like they did in Australia so they're deep in the plan seriously. They're hoping to see at least a 30% increase in local supplies from that. That's huge. And, um, and we believe it's the most cost effective way to do this because we're also having to deal with stormwater pollution. We're also having to deal with new intensified flooding because of uh, the climate changes. And so if we coordinate and smartly invest our dollars, it opens up the ball game. I, I wanted to just um, flip over to because you mentioned bills and what Moss said about the new uh, and no, no longer anonymous water. If you bring up slide number nine, this is a water bill from the city of Melbourne from uh, one of their water agencies, Yarra Water. And you'll see that um, you can't read the fine print, but the thing to look at is all those human the 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 column with one person two two people, what they did is start making water use very real for each family. So what you're seeing there is how many gallons per person per day based on what your water use was that month. And then you're compared with your neighbors, anonymously in this case. But everyone wants to do good. Everyone thinks they're doing good until they get real feedback. Mm -hmm. And when they got the real mirror, boy, did it change. But they're not just doing this. Their, their new investment, and go to slide number eight. Check this out. This is in a kitchen, in a new development. The kitchen, and all the kitchens have these monitors. And this monitor is electricity, gas, and, and greenhouse gases, but this wow. is the water screen. And you'll see mains water, recycled water, rain water, hot water. Not only is water no longer anonymous, what we were stunned by is that the population's literacy has really jumped. And just like the Eskimos have 100 names for snow, Australians in cities and in the country now have multiple names for water. They're very clear about recycled water, rain water, well water, or bore water. And they're using all of that. And in all new developments, purple pipe is being delivered to every home. So purple pipe, recycled water, is, is providing water for landscape, for laundry, for toilet flushing, right into the house. There is um, the leadership and a big leap. And, and this is, for them, it's no longer the future. They are horrified when they hear that, what, that we throw away the rain. They can't believe it. Uh, this I, clarification, was that, that, that's an Australian example you're giving? This, yeah, all of yeah. what I'm talking about happens to be Australia because they've been investing so seriously, not just during the drought, but now they're going deeper. So rainwater was initially uh, being installed for, again, to uh, plumb to the toilet and to the washing machine and for use in the landscape to keep their, their home crops and, and mm -hmm. greenery alive. Sanjay, I yeah. know you have something yeah, I, I to share. Yeah, I think this is great, Andy. I mean, one, yeah, what I see in the industry is, um, you know, as an industry, we've done a relatively good job in pricing water, I think. Um, there are some more challenges ahead, but information is what's really lacking. A lot of it, you know, utilities um, bill on a 30-day cycle or on a 60-day cycle, so you get a bill. And during a drought condition, such as in Santa Cruz, for instance, Santa Cruz is in a drought, and people can only use nine units. Once you go above nine units, a penalty comes in at $25 per unit. And then once you go above that first unit, it's $50 a unit. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is, is how do you know where you are on that spectrum right. until end? Mm -hmm. And so real-time information. And, and the other thing to me that's sort of just lacking is like, you know, the technology should be there. We, everyone has a wireless device in their house. We have a meter there. So why don't we have some kind of simple device you just add 
I mean, I, I, again, I'm not a tech person, Secretary but it's available. Ross, we just need to change the game. It's just ready right. to jump in here. Well, just uh, only because someone was in my office two weeks ago of what East Bay Med has done, mm -hmm. and it yeah, was simply have. by tying all their databases together. They had conservation right. programs that were over here doing this thing, and supply guys over here doing this thing. They tied it all together, so they benchmark everybody. Right. Yeah. They get to see that information, which was very similar, so now I know where they got the idea. Thank you again, Australia. <laughs> but what was really interesting is for that household, there would be three tips to save water mm -hmm. and it was tied to people who had already taken advantage of taking out turf and it mm -hmm. would have three other suggestions of where there were incentive programs mm -hmm. to help them save water so they brought it all together this idea of integration yes. is so necessary we in government know that especially how good we are inside our silos but we've got to start marrying this mm -hmm. all together yeah they're, they're, this they're is good but there's but there's two things I'd like to share first of all I share the, in, the enthusiasm for these ideas as water gets more valuable, it pays to invest in tracking it and improve your decision making. But let me just share two brief personal stories. I just bought a house in Lake Elsinore, beautiful overlooking the lake, and I got this uh, material from the water district, and they have that stage pricing that Sanjay was talking about. Then the next question, they said, do you want to do auto pay? Mm. Wait a minute. If I do auto, by the way, I do auto pay, uh, because but if I but if you're auto paying, mm -hmm. you're sort of what's all this Correct. stuff about? No that? feedback. Yeah. There's no, no feedback. So that's an interesting sort of tension, and then I guess about these ideas, and then the second one is uh, there's some work being done at uh, Claremont Graduate University Economics Department, Behavioral Economics. And they just finished a study for uh, so Southern California Edison and Electricity. There's something in the literature called left digit bias. And what that means is when someone looks at a bill, they don't really focus on it until the left digit is above some number. <laughs> and the higher your income is, the higher that <laughs> digit has to be before you do anything. So I think in addition to the technical side, I think the behavioral side has to be looked into. Uh, and it was just fascinating. And, and I, uh, by the way, I'm on the board, so, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, so I guess I'm pitching the work of my university. I think farmers are worried if that's a negative on that far left side. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's see, where are we now? Uh, Susan, a lot of money's gotta be thrown into this industry, mm. a lot of pain, a lot of adjustment. Um, what's your thoughts about how we should be rethinking water pricing? Well, I think the reference that, um, that um, was earlier made by the secretary about um, these different informational, and I think you made it as well about these, and then this, the case from Australia. That, I believe the um, East Bay Mud, uh, the, the Alameda County uh, Water Utility, I believe they're using a group called uh, Water Smart. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a private company that uh, has just started getting going, and I think they have a pilot uh, with East Bay Mud, and there are a number of other smaller water utilities. Just, they've just been around for a couple years. And I think that information is, is going to be key. Um, I don't know if, if, when we get into information and we get into about how much water use, um, I don't know if we're, we really want to start focusing on our water footprint like we do on our calories. You know, for example, you go into some places, uh, some cities now they'll tell you if that burger is, um, you know, how many hundreds or thousands of calories and maybe they have to have next to it that um, it's also that eight ounces of beef um, is 630 gallons of water. Um, so I guess it comes down to, and you're talking about pricing, how much are we prepared to, and you were talking about how we're getting to higher nutrition with less water. I'm just wondering how much we're really thinking about matching that nutrition value with the water footprint. And I hope I'm not getting too kind of abstract or out there with folks, but, but think of it this way. If you thought about how much water you use for some of the products, 
we would be eating less beef and we would not be drinking much milk because they're not water efficient products. They're not a high value, a high nutritional value for the amount of water you use. And we've talked about groundwater and we talked about surface, I mean, this trying to measure groundwater. If we get into really valuing water mm -hmm. and getting past the cost of service, because we're not talking about a water utility now, we're talking about the water to grow our food, then I think we're gonna start to say, do we wanna use up that much of our surface water, that much of our groundwater, if we really knew how much we were using for crops that were not um, a, a high nutritional value based on the water, do we, and do we want to pay more? And I think if we get to that point, and I think we will, we will be paying more for beef. We will be paying more for things like dairy that have a high water footprint. I know that's, you know, I, I know it's, I, I'm sort of saying like, let them eat nuts or something like that <laughs> should be my mantra. But um, uh, I, I think that we're gonna get to that quandary. Chicken. Well, Moss, is, now it's back to you, right? I mean, yeah, let them eat peaches. Yeah. 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 Um, as we do know, agriculture is an industry that has been constantly rediscovering itself and adapting. Mm -hmm. The role of technology has been huge in its history, and if the city folks don't understand it, shame on you. Uh, so now you're in a world where you, how much water are you going to have in the future is much less than you had in the past. Mm -hmm. What is available to using costs a lot more than it did in the past. Mm -hmm. What do you see in your crystal ball about how you're going to adapt? Well, I think there are a couple of things. One, technology will continue to, to be advanced in this field. Uh, there is a challenge because technology could only accomplish so much. I think another way of looking at that is, uh, example, on our farm, we do furrow irrigating, which on the surface looks awful. Uh, but there is this other side of it. What's the price of drip irrigation versus furrow for soil health? Mm -hmm. Drip irrigation kills soil life because it doesn't have organic life because it's only a small area that's irrigated. So as an organic farmer who wants to nurture soil life for a habitat, uh, furrow irrigation works fantastic. So maybe research technology could be examining the, the use of furrow irrigation and what's the most efficient at that. The other aspect is there will be more fallowing or um, uh, land that's being taken out of production. And you've seen that already. It happened on our farm. Uh, and so I think because dollars are chasing the water. So the third aspect, I think, is that you're going to grow higher and higher value crops. Mm -hmm. And clearly, you're seeing that throughout the state. Uh, the crops that have the most return on investment are going to be the ones that survive. But there's a little tricky element in that, because one of the questions that we posed on our farm, what's one of the prices of water? And it often is, how big of fruit do we grow and what's the amount of water does it take to grow that peach a certain size? Wow. So one of the revolutions that we have, and I'd love to launch this Masamoto Family Farm Initiative, is to start growing petite peaches. <laughs> yeah. And I will charge double the price for that. <laughs> so it, it goes back to the theme of how do you do more with less? Right. Uh, and you've seen that actually in the wine crop this right. year uh -huh. with the drought. Uh, the wine grapes actually it has to go with stressing the vines. They produce more sugars, and actually had a much high, higher quality wine grape in this vintage this year. It happened on our farm this past summer. We had smaller peaches, but the flavor was more intense. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm going to experiment with next year is trying to really stress some of the trees to see how much flavor intensity, but Mm. The market has to adjust to that because I always get penalized for small peaches. Mm -hmm. But maybe this drought could make a big shift in that mentality. And, and we're going to start charging for tree and grape therapy to bring all those stressed vines. Yeah. <laughs> well, we also have this year, certainly our governor had asked us all to uh, cut back our use. And um, Fran, uh, what, state board, you get those reports monthly. We can pull up uh, slide number seven, uh, slide 12. Okay, this is, this is us. This is the state uh, for this summer, June, July, August, September, comparing 
water used this year versus water used last year. And as you can see, we used less, Every but we used a lot last year, which is one reason we're in such a bad drought this year. <laughs> and so, uh, and this was done largely with um, education and uh, uh, lots of good media coverage, a little bit of fear that people might get uh, fined up to $500 by their local water agency uh, if, they, if they didn't do uh, more. But there is a long, long way to go. And get, getting to the, uh, the story that you told about your new, uh, your new place um, and being asked to automatically pay, which, you, which everyone will do because it's, it is uh, more, much more convenient, the uh, feedback does not have to come through your bill. The feedback can come on your phone. The feedback as to how much water you're using and, and what kinds of water you're using and where you're, what, you're, what suggestions are there for you to do better uh, can come on your phone. It doesn't have to come with a bill. In fact, it's more effective if it doesn't come with a bill because a lot of people just pay the bill and they don't read what's in the packet or uh, they, don't, they have someone else pay their bills and they don't read anything. Uh, so uh, I think that education is going to be huge. Let's move to 13. These are some of the ideas that we are putting together now as to the kinds of things that we are going to need to be doing over the next, uh, uh, cur uh, over the next year or so and over the next five to 10 years. Rate design, I'll go down to the longer term actions because the uh, near term actions are uh, pretty self evident. Uh, rate design is going to be very important, and we're, we'll be using the services of uh, several of the folks that are on this panel uh, today and uh, many, many others. Uh, water agencies will be wanting to create a rate design so that they aren't penalized for using less. Mm -hmm. They're not penalized for smaller peaches. They're not penalized for reducing the amount of water that they, uh, that they have. Uh, water and energy synergies. We need to be working with the energy companies. We need to be working through the cap and trade program. There's a little tiny um, pilot that was done this year for, with cap and trade in agriculture as well as in uh, uh, urban areas. And we need to be doing a lot more of that. We need to be doing uh, the rainwater capture, stormwater capture, and reuse, which Andy's been talking about. Installation of meters is going to be hugely important if we want to get to markets. Uh, in a big way. Um, large scale recycling, again, hugely important. All the things that, that have been talked about on this panel, very important, and they all can and will work together. Um, and that's, that's what this administration is all about, and my guess is it's what the next administration will be all about if we're smart. Mm -hmm. Just to, to follow on, there's a lot, of, a, a lot of opportunities, opportunities for investment and interface in that laundry list. It's not a laundry list. I mean, this is an action list. And so, you know, one of the things that's interesting is uh, you mentioned the water energy nexus. So uh, what does that term mean? The largest single use of electricity in the state of California is to pump water to Los Angeles in the, just the California aqueduct. Just to pump the water over the mountains, the largest single use of electricity in the state. So. Uh, we've been talking with Southern California Edison, and they looked at the numbers and the implications of saving energy by harvesting local rainwater, changing that to investing in human energy and human capital instead of carbon-based energy. And they saw that it would actually behoove them if they were allowed to from the Public Utilities Commission, which they are not allowed to. They would love to invest in building a distributed, smart rainwater hmm. harvesting grid in Los Angeles. We're hoping we'll be able to do that. The PUC has now opened the rulemaking pro process. If they do that, then they'll be able to get credit for building that system and taking down the energy use by shifting water supply to locals. Very cool. Yeah. And, and let, uh, I, I will kind of jump in here. I want uh, not to contradict uh, uh, Andy on this, but actually the, uh, uh, a big use of water is at the at the end user inside the home at the commercial uh, commercial facilities at your industrial facilities 
that is a, a bigger slice of the pie. And I think uh, many of the uh, new technologies will be uh, focusing on getting to, to that, particularly in the commercial, uh, industrial, and institutional schools uh, sector. Mm. Uh, that, there's a lot of opportunity there. Get rid of those lawns, get, make your, uh, put in meters, and make sure you're efficiently using energy and water in every part of your business. And uh, we will make great strides in addition to, uh, to dealing with imported water. Yeah, um, just on my personal situation, I put in a rainbird system <laughs> uh, where basically it brings in the information of the, um, what, of uh, precipitation, mm -hmm. heat, and, and all that to manage how much I water, because mm -hmm. I'm not smart enough to make those decisions. <laughs> that's hard. But that's an it example is. of technological right. uh, adoption. Uh, S Secretary Ross, um, we've, we've heard about now we have groundwater legislation that's placing the primary role of groundwater management at the local level, thank God, yet direct implementation is still quite a few years off. We're still in the reality. Moss is going back home. Uh, he's uh, short on water and he's probably in an area where they're trying to figure out how to manage their groundwater for the first time. How do you see sort of the necessity of what's happening and needs to happen in terms of sustaining his business in, in a world where probably the projects aren't gonna give us much water this year? How do we get out of sort of a conflict between worsening our groundwater situation in the short term? So groundwater is meant to be our buffer in times of drought. The challenge has been because of some um, legal decisions, biological opinions, and other things, the delivery of surface water has been interrupted, so we've been overly dependent, even in non-drought years, on that groundwater pumping. But we also know we didn't get there overnight, and there's huge understanding on the part of this governor and the people in the administration that it will take time um, to do this effectively at the local level. Step number one, bringing all the stakeholders together. So there's ownership about how we're going to go about doing this. But still putting, for some communities, two and a half years isn't going to be enough right. to really do that. But that's, that's a very real deadline that has to be met. We also had to have time for the Department of Water Resources to go through a transparent public process for what is the criteria for how we're going to evaluate whether the plans that they then spend the next three years developing would be adequate to move them towards sustainability. So, you know, groundwater, is a, a long-term business, and we need to have time to really incentivize and practice consumptive use so that we're taking every advantage to recharge those basins at every opportunity that we have so that, as we know with climate change, we have more frequent droughts. That groundwater will be there to do exactly what it was designed to do and get off of being overly dependent in, in years where we have closer to normal precipitation. If, if, if one aspect of that too is that it's all about local jurisdiction and local control because water really is localized mm -hmm. and we don't think of the state in terms of watersheds and what watershed do you belong to right. uh, and I think that's part of that new uh, water identity yes. I think we all need to start establishing and, right. and that was oh. that was the fundamental principle for the administration is right. that the state is too large and too diverse to do one size fits all. That's why I said thank God on that one. Because, by the way, again, Australia, I mean, I was down there 15 years ago to give them some advice on transformation out of their socialist institutions, and they were into catchments. Mm -hmm. and we, uh, we, we don't even have that uh, concept here no. today. Well, that's a watershed. I mean, it's the same yeah. term. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. yeah. But, 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 but they, the catchment is really important part of the management for them. Mm -hmm. We know we're in a watershed, but we don't manage it that way yet. We're going that way. Sanjay, um, uh, why don't you and I be sure that Fran uh, retains this go on water rate design? Mm -hmm. um, so what's your thoughts about how can we bring in the economic value of water into pricing? Well, I mean, I think before we, uh, let me answer, before I answer that question, just step back and ask ourselves, what do we use water for? What are the different facets? So the challenge is, is that we use it for health and safety. It's just a necessary good, as we know. Um, we use it for outdoor needs, for having, a, um, um, for lawns. We also use it for aesthetics, 
Um, we use it for outdoor, such as soccer fields. And then we also use it for co uh, commercial use, uh, for farming. And so the challenge is now, how do we price water given the limitations that we have, and also to make sure water is affordable for basic health and needs, and also we um, collect enough revenue during all this volatility. And so some of the new kind of rates that we've been developing in the community, and one of them is actually in Elsinore Valley, um, we're um, working with them right now, and another one's El Toro Water District, is what we call a water budget rate structure. And a water budget rate structure is where you define efficiency. And that's what we've been uh, basically hinting at throughout this whole panel, is, is to promote efficient water use. So we're not asking people necessarily under normal, under normal conditions, we're not asking people not to change their lifestyle. We're saying, given your lifestyle, how much water should you use if you're efficient? If you're a person, a household of three, you have a certain lot size, you have this much to irrigate, how much should you use? And then try to make us within reason, within the framework that we have to work in cost of service and legal framework, um, price it so that water is affordable for health and safety, the indoor needs, moderately more expensive for outdoor needs, and then progressively very expensive for what we would call waste for excessive needs. And the concept is, is that the marginal price of water would be reflected in the wasteful needs. So the desal plant, recycling, stormwater catching, that would be all funded in the higher tiers. Mm. And then the idea is, is that revenues generated in the higher tiers would be put in a set, set aside in a special fund to fund that. So those individuals who are efficient with their water needs would necessarily not see that much of a bail impact because they're basically doing a good job. And those people who are considered wasteful and, uh, and we would use, uh, people in the water industry use the word wasteful or unsustainable, so there's that terminology. It's political, some board members don't like that, some people do, um, and, but the concept is, is, again, that's paid in the higher tiers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the future where we're showing the marginal cost of water in the higher tiers, mm -hmm. and we're not looking at costs that we already incur. Usually as a water district we say, well, what's my cost right now? And this is more progressive and saying, what will my cost be? if people continue this pattern and consider the climate that we're about to enter in, what are the costs that I'm gonna experience in the next five or 10 years, and how can I start collecting that revenue now and give that information to customers? Because maybe customers are willing to pay for it, or maybe they're not. And it's an opportunity now for customers to tell us, yes, build that desal plant, I'm willing to pay a lot more because I want um, to still water my grass, or maybe, you know what, I'm willing to change my lifestyle, um, and I don't want that desal plant. Well, we have uh, monopolized our time thus far. And being from the University of Chicago, I love competition. <laughs> so the floor is, please uh, raise your hand and speak loudly. Sir, in front. Is there any role for desalination in the state of the plant being built in Carlsbad or some other proposals? So everyone can hear you. OK, I'm sorry. I asked, is there a role for desalination in addressing the issues? Yes. There, there is a role for desalination. We're, we're working now very hard and hopefully we'll adopt um, uh, regulations for desal so that the, the, the um, uh, playing field is more level, is, is clearer as to what people have to do in order to do desalination. But desalination is expensive. It's the most expensive form of water. And so um, many uh, communities and many uh, areas will choose to, to go for conservation or for uh, 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 stormwater capture or recycled water first mm -hmm. uh, before they uh, are, in a way, forced to move to desalination. Because when they move to desalination, they will pay higher rates. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's the thing that is most limiting to desalination, not the technology, uh, not even, in my opinion, uh, regulations after uh, we adopt those in, I, I'm in the spring. The big question that will be, what's the value of supply reliability? <laughs> yes. And whether exactly. or not the, the, the cost, you know, that you're talking about, yes, it's above something else, but if it's more reliable, what's the premium for reliability? Right. And that is something I think within five years we'll have a lot of data on. Well, and especially in agriculture with more and more permanent crops, all of a right. sudden the value of reliability for that huge capital investment starts to change the discussion. Yes, in fact, we did see that this uh, last right. year, what was it, Rosedale Water <laughs> District had what for, up for auction was about 10,000 acre feet of water and what the winning bids were over $1,000 an acre foot, 
and they're all ag users because they're protecting their trees. Now that doesn't mean they'll pay a thousand dollars a year and you're out for water. They would maybe not plant the trees, but but more and more people are sort of getting slapped into thinking about these things. How well, you know how much is it worth to you? I know anyway, so there's, there's more answers though on okay. that. So data from Australia, because uh, California see the water sitting out there. It seems like it's a piece of cake. Just desal it, pump it up. It is extremely water uh, energy intensive. The good, the really great stories from Australia are counterbalanced by some cautionary tales and a lot of learning that's happening. And in year 10 and a half, when everybody was freaked out in Australia, they, they turned on the switch for building billions of dollars worth of desal plants around the country. Um, except in uh, Perth, the one city that is completely dry, none of those plants are operating because people have done such a good job hmm. in conserving that they don't need them. Now, they're there as an insurance policy, but they doubled the price of water across the country. Every state government was thrown out of office because of people being so pissed off <laughs> at, at that investment. In the longer term, it's, it's starting to be appreciated again. Instead of being thought of as a mistake, now it's a, an insurance policy. And so the reliability side is there. But uh, we just interviewed lots of water leaders, and they said it's appropriate, but don't throw everything at that because it's not going to be available right when you need it. Put some in it. Invest moderately in that. It's really your last investment. And make sure you invest in everything else. And the other thing is that it's not an investment in economic development, where other options that begin to really invest in conservation. And by the way, I do want to say that water, water use and water use is so important. Here, 50% of the water in Los Angeles is used in landscape. And 70%, up to 70% across Southern California. I didn't answer your question, but that investment is now, LA is offering 375 exactly. a square. You're starting to filibuster, right. this gentleman. <laughs> Hi, is this on? Because we got 13 minutes. <laughs> We're a plumbing material supplier, and we've supplied thousands of homes this year. There wasn't one gray water system in any of those homes. What's the plan on changing that? Well, the governor's office is quite interested in, in gray water, and the Office of Planning and Research has just uh, hired a person to, to help uh, work on this. Uh, starting, uh, I believe it was at the beginning, in, in January, the plumbing code was changed to make gray water use much easier for Californians. And, um, but many of the cities and counties that, that control the permits for uh, installing these gray water systems uh, are, uh, you know, are catching up to, to these changes. So I think gray water has a future uh, in, the, in the near term, but uh, it has taken, and, and the groundwork is there, but um, it's a little premature to be able to say it's going to be 10% of the market, 1% of the market, or 50%. I mean, it's, it's just premature. If I just may say, the, what's also going there is the, your local district has to step up and make the case for the investment to move right. there. If you have a local district that's worried about, you know, a municipal change in their water rate, then it'll be a long time coming. Mm -hmm. Why should it be just a district? And, you know, the other issue that you have is putting in a gray, putting a gray water system in after the house is built mm -hmm. right. is almost impossible. Right, right. Yeah. exactly. That's true. Yeah. Well, it's all and, about and, vision, isn't it? And I, yeah. I would say this is true for recycled water, for storm water, for uh, a lot of retrofit can can occur, and, and Australia has shown how that works, and Andy can help you figure out how to do it. But all the new development that will take place over the next several years, uh, that is where we really need to be putting in these new systems, whether it be recycled water uh, or uh, gray water or storm water, and we should have it all there. So building on top of that, we work with a lot of multifamily developers here in Los Angeles, many of which are exploring gray water. They're very interested in sustainability. But you, I want, I'm curious, Andy, what you learned in Australia, if you're just storing water on site, you've got to treat and filter that water. Otherwise, stuff starts to grow in it. And so that's been the challenge, NSF 350, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about how we might cost effectively 
uh, use that water that obviously is going to be such an important part of our profile going forward? Well, I think the, the general rule here with gray water is you don't store it. You use it right away. Uh, you put it in mulch. You, uh, we need to actually be increasing soil moisture. I, I uh, concur with Moss, and I'll, if I have time, I'll get into the other cautionary tale about how they lost their trees and, had it, uh, and mm. parks had a huge impact on public health in the cities. And all the cities are now built, they are actually tapping the sewers to treat the water so they can actually have green space to protect uh, the public from severe heat, which is, uh, they're, they're losing people. But to bridge you to that, the last question, uh, the LA Plumbers Union told us to go see this plumbing industry and union built training center um, in Melbourne that is stunning, state of the art, multiple warehouses where they're training plumbers how to install gray water, rainwater, and all this. The issue with, with gray water is the fears of public health uh, and technology. So they there have filtration systems. Um, these are still expensive, state of the art where you can treat it, then store it. But um, I, I encourage you to go and see it. We can point you in the right direction. They actually have an American flag on the center along with an Australian and Canadian flag because apparently we helped invest in creating it. Sir. I'm surprised that we spent an, an entire hour talking about water without talking about the largest water infrastructure project proposal in the state, which is the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. $25 billion. Delta has been the backbone of the state's water supply for half a century. The governor is championing that project. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on um, that project and the future role of the Delta in our state's water supply. Well, Fran? Yeah. Uh, well, Fran and Karen, uh, <laughs> we have a, the governor's position is our position. <laughs> Uh, it's a huge project, and it, right now it's going through environmental review, and it's uh, had to go back and do some retooling of the environmental review. We'll see how that, that comes out. Everyone's taking this extremely seriously. It is a high priority for the governor. It is not a short-term solution. It, uh, there are many shoals uh, before it, uh, it happens, and so uh, the main uh, focus right now is making sure the science is right, making sure the financing is understood, making sure that we know what we're buying, what we're building. And uh, we're still in the midst of that. So uh, you, I, you know, I support the governor on, on his priorities and so and I assume so, Karen does <laughs> well of course I do because our, our Delta is this fragile ecosystem and it's broken and we need to invest in ecosystem restoration and and ensure that we can continue to move water in our very highly engineered water infrastructure I mean that's just a fact of life we have a very engineered system um, and I've had people express concern that with all the other things we're doing in water and we are doing a lot of things in water, people are very concerned that the focus will be lost on this very long-term solution. But the reason the governor asked us to prepare the California Water Action Plan that was released in January is that there are comprehensive integrated sets of things that we can be doing over the next five years that would improve our resiliency, make sure that we're planning for drought in a changing climate, and not lose focus on this very long-term project. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of investment that's already been made. Metropolitan Water District expressed that to me just again the other day, that's being made in this long-term solution. And as long as he's governor, that we will continue to have a lot of work going into that. But also, he wants us to walk and chew bubble gum at the same time and make sure we're investing in these actions that we can actually do over the next five years to improve our resiliency. And it's important to, to <coughs> note that the, um, this is for, really for efficiency of moving the water and not harming uh, wildlife in the delta. The, that's what the, uh, the uh, big project is, is uh, designed to do, not to create a lot of, new, right. not, not to that's create right. new water. This is not new water. So, right. Andy's ideas and recycled right. water and conservation are all going to be needed with the mm -hmm. uh, BDCP. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the benefits of having a blog is you have stuff in writing. One of the disadvantages of having a blog, you have your <laughs> stuff in writing. Go to hydrowonk.com Hydro. blog, and I have an eight-part series that I'll say uh, <laughs> expresses respectful skepticism. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Uh, next question. 
How, how does the panel feel about uh, adding new above ground water storage? We were, we were, uh, I was enthusiastically working with my colleagues on the water bond, which was informed and crafted around the water action plan to make sure we weren't just focusing on one thing because there's no silver bullet for the water situation. So the ability to capture more snowpack on those years where hopefully this will be one of those years we actually have it to feed our system throughout the year is very important, but it's not the only solution. And you've heard a lot of ideas about everything that we need to do in an integrated resource management approach for our water reliability. And I would, I would add to that, that, that storage, we, Andy's talking about storage, mm -hmm. huge amounts of storage. Recycled water is about storage. Groundwater is about storage. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't talk about water and not mm -hmm. want to have good storage and, but you're going to need to have increasingly more integrated storage so that when recycled water is available, it's going into the ground or it's going into a reservoir or it's being used uh, properly in a, in a new development. So storage is not a bad idea. In fact, it's a good idea. It just has to be integrated with other, uh, with all the, the other ideas that are going on. And yeah, I'll just a, also um, answer that. I think the site's reservoir project require, uh, warrants a very good look. I can't tell you today I'm convinced it's viable, but I think we do have a couple of above ground storage opportunities where I think we'll be investing as a society into looking into that. Whether or not we pull the trigger on that project, I can't tell you. One of the biggest problems you need for a water storage project is have water to store. Right. <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but to that point, though, I, I uh, agree with the other um, comments on water storage because the, in this drought, the urban uh, water utilities that are in okay shape are those that have storage. Yes, and, exactly. have the and, and it was storage. regional scale. I mean, I mean metro, I mean, that's the thing, why metropolitan, metropolitan, yeah. The uh, Hetch Hetchy system, those are systems that are exactly. storage. Yeah, the okay. areas that are really affected by this drought right now are those that don't have that much storage. Right. And why don't, I mean, really in Southern California, we don't have, we have a regulatory drought right now. We don't right. have the severeness yet, and it's because of metropolitans. Has then well, gone. But MWD is getting pretty scared. I don't know. Oh, yeah, but, <laughs> well, yeah, but no, but now, now, but you're right. No, but uh, we, we have three minutes, okay, and sorry. I think we have some other hands, so mm -hmm. please. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm the Australian Consul General. Oh. Thank you very much for all the plugs you've been giving us. <laughs> <laughs> very, very grateful. Um, and I think, yes, we have, we came through, and John and I are products of this, cha this sea change in the way Australians think about water. I, I, I gas and I'm, are horrified when I see people watering footpaths and the fact that I can't find a dual flush Sidewalk. toilet, etc. You know, it, it's so ingrained in us now that it, it, it really um, is a very positive influence. Um, we're very happy to be working um, with California and that the delegations are coming down. And I know it's a bit cheeky, but I'm an Australian, so I will do it. Um, <laughs> but uh, Governor Brown has asked us to work with his office and we'll be holding in Sacramento on the 9th mm -hmm. and 10th of December, an event where we're bringing across Australian um, water authorities, Australian water companies, technology companies, and we will be swapping um, details of our experience, how we learnt from our mistakes, um, what we're doing in future, and how we can share that with California. So I would encourage um, all of you to come up and take part in that because I think it'll be very instructive. And I want to say thank you to the Karen and people in, San in Sacramento and to Andy for the work he's done. But um, come and join us. It's not that difficult. Okay, time for one more question. Hi. The, the city of Los Angeles has an urban uh, uh, management uh, water plan. And it currently projects going from 11% local water to 36% local water by the year 2035. And to get there, it's going to take a considerable investment, which the most likely source of that investment would be through rate increases. So how would you advise the city of LA to convince its public that this is a good investment uh, for the future? Well, what I would suggest is you talk to Maureen Stapleton, San Diego County Water <laughs> Authority, because she's been the leader in uh, going out between the IID deal 
mm -hmm. which Metropolitan thought was overpriced, to bringing in Carlsbad, DeSalle, and that community down there got into a consensus that they had a water supply reliability problem. So the first step in the program was you got a problem. It's worth investing. If you, I think you have to put the rate issue in the context of an investment. And if you don't, then you're going to be, I guess, thrown out. Uh, you know, I took over a water utility that had seven years rate freeze when I, when I joined it. I started running it. And we went out, we talked to our customers. We needed big yeah. rate increases, five years of rate increases, double digit rate increases, and we went out and talked to our customers. Be honest with people, be transparent. In DC, they raised their rates, at, they hired 13 PR professionals for their water agency. DWP is not really allowed to do PR work right now, so it's not it's educating its public. Its, it's hands are tied, it's got to do that. They've got to do it. But I would say that also they have to prove that, in fact, they're using water wisely now. Mm -hmm. And in the, the recent deal with uh, Owens Valley and with the Air Board uh, for the water in Owens Valley, I think is an example of how they are starting to make that case. And hopefully they'll make even more cases. Yeah, um, well, I want to thank you. We're out of time. I guess the action items are when a resource has now become extraordinarily valuable and in the face of the uncertainties, I think there, I hope a lot of you got a lot of uh, ideas of how you can invest in technology to help either in the monitoring, measuring, or decision making of water management, as well as trading. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. And thank you to this wonderful panel. Thank you.